Welcome to our English worship this morning. Three months ago, we began a new sermon series on the twelve minor prophets of the Old Testament. The title of the series is Minority Report, singular, not plural. And this is because the biblical scholar believe that the twelve prophets are not just twelve individual prophetic books. They were also put together by an anonymous redactor later on after the return from exile to form one unified volume. So it's twelve minor prophets, but also one volume consisted of twelve minor prophets. Among the twelve. Hosea emerged as the first. He is the leader, the captain of the twelve. The central theme of Hosea is God's hesed love, his covenant love, his steadfast love within his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this love is expressed through his repeated warning of judgment and his call for us to return and repent. And that is the message of the book of Hosea. Is also the message of the twelve prophets. After Hosea comes Joel. The central theme of Joel is the day of the Lord, Yom Yahweh. Moving on from a recent event of the play of locusts, he projects us into the distant future when God will bring about His final judgment, the day of the Lord. And like Hosea, Joel calls upon us to quickly repent and return to the Lord, that we may escape his wrathful judgment. Joel is then followed by Amos, and this is the、uh, book that we are going to study. What is the theme of Amos?、Uh, if you are here last week,、uh, you should remember what I said. Uh, the theme, the central theme of Amos, is not justice, as many people think. It is worship, the exclusive worship of the one true God, and that's what Amos is calling us to. This is how the book begins. Amos or Amos, chapter one, verse two. The Lord roars from Zion; it's like a lion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The pastor of the shepherd mourn. And the top of camel withers. So then, after he opened up with this imagery of a lion roaring,、uh, Amos、uh, continued with a declaration of judgment against six Gentile nation or six Gentile people. It goes something like this: Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of each nation and for four, I will send a fire, and that fire will devour their stronghold. These six nations or peoples are Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and finally Moab. Yes, these six Gentile peoples are mere appetizer to the entire meal. As it turns out, the main dishes in God's great feast of judgment. You see, God is cooking up a great feast of judgment. The main dishes are Judah and Israel, not the Gentiles. But his own people, Judah and Israel. So Amos chapter two verse four, that says the Lord for three transgression of Judah, now no longer about a Gentile nation, and for four I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. It's unthinkable that the people that God is targeting the final judgment on is actually. His own people, here Judah and Israel can be seen as one people, like a pair of conjoined twins. They share the same spiritual DNA, and they are partners in crime against Yahweh. So they they are Judah and Israel together. They form the judgment target number seven in the book of Amos, and seven, as you may remember, is the perfect number for the Jews. What is the final target? What is the one and only main target of God's judgment? Is Judah and is Israel, and they stage a perfect rebellion against the Holy God with three transgression and four. Three plus four equal to seven. They have seven transgressions, seven perfect rebellion against one perfect holy 
God. So God's anger is now burning against Judah and Israel. Why? Because of this. They have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes and their lies have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked. The lies are the lies of the idols. So instead of following Yahweh wholeheartedly, they have been worshipped idol as well, and they fall asleep while they listen to the word of Yahweh. But they awaken and follow the lies of all the other Canaanite idols. So God's anger is burning against them, despite the fact that God has been sending prophets to them to speak his word again and again these people fail to listen to the word of god they rejected the law of god and because they do not love god with their hearts see what happened when you don't love god with their heart they will not love their neighbors with their deeds so amos chapter 2 verse 6 now moving on from god to their relationship with their neighbor, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, seven transgressions now against their neighbor. Why? Because they have not loved the Lord, so now they will not love their neighbor. I will not revoke the punishment. So they violated the second half of the Ten Commandments. We all, always know the Ten Commandments got ten and first half and second half, they, they violated the second half of the Ten Commandments, mistreating and abusing their poor and needy neighbors. Why? Because they failed the first half first. Because they had not loved the Lord and therefore they would not love their neighbor. Notice that their sins against the neighbors are only symptoms of the true spiritual sickness. What is the true spiritual sickness? It is simply that they do not love God and they do not love His Word. And so God's judgment will surely come upon this wayward and rebellious people. And it is under this backdrop that Amos wants to bring us back to the exclusive worship of one true God. And that's the theme. He's calling us to turn from this idolatry to the worship of one true God. There are a total of nine chapters in the book of Amos. And the book's center of gravity is right in the middle, in Amos chapter 5. So that nine chapter, what is the middle chapter? The middle chapter is Amos 5. But where in 5 is the center of gravity of the entire book? Many Christians misplay the center at Amos chapter 5, verse 24, perhaps because it's the only verse they could remember from that book. And maybe you remember that verse too, Amos chapter 5, verse 24. But let justice roll down like rivers, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We even make many songs about this verse, and because it's the only verse we know from the book of Amos, we thought it has to be the center, but it's not. Do you still remember the personal story I shared from last week, a very humbling and embarrassing encounter with my Old Testament professor. It was many, many years ago when I first started working in Singapore, and it was my first time attending a seminary on a, like, just like a part-time course. And I jumped straight right into a third-year course on Old Testament theology. I have no idea what I'm doing. And then my first theological paper is from the Old Testament. So that day, I walked up to Dr. William Dumbrell, who was semi-retired by then. He has spent most of his career as the academic dean at Regent College in Canada. And he had a PhD from Harvard. So after, uh, you know, I have made up my mind to write on the book of Amos, I walk over to him and say, Professor Dumbra, I'm going to write on Amos. And he asked me, what are you writing? Uh, what theme are you writing on? And I say, the theme is social justice. And then the first question he asked me is, have you done your literary analysis? And I have no idea what he is talking about. What literary analysis? Amos is just a shepherd, right? 
And I will never forget how he responded to me. He said, do not underestimate the shepherds of Israel. Never underestimate the shepherd of Israel. David was a shepherd too. He became the king. And then he said to me sternly, do not underestimate your congregation. Do not cut corners when you prepare for your sermon. Do not cheat on your preparation. Feed the sheep of God. And then he said, the central theme of Amos is not justice, but worship. I remember having another conversation with Dumbrell later on about going to seminary full time. I was thinking about returning to the US for seminary. And he said, you have to choose a seminary that firmly believes the Bible to be the word of God. And I was puzzled because I have no idea. I said, which Bible college, which seminary will not believe the Bible to be the word of God? As it turned out, many don't believe that anymore. He said, you have to go to a place where they believe the word, the, the, the Bible to be the word of God, so that you will preach it the rest of your life. And then he gave me some names. And I recognized some of those names. And, and then I said to him, I heard the school that you are recommending to me is very academic. You know, I know about this school, but I just don't think it is right for me because I'm not an academic person. And I told him I wanted to be a missionary. I just want to be a missionary. I want to share the gospel with ordinary people on the street. Do I, should I still go to an academic institution like this? And then he said to me, you better devote your next three, four years to the study of the word. After that, you can do anything you want. And then he warned me, on the other hand, if you don't know your Bible well, you will never be useful for God. I'll never forget what he said. It's so true, right? If we don't know the Bible, we could be very diligent in church, we could be involved in many services, but what use is it? On the other hand, if we know our Bible well, the Lord will surely cause to be useful for his kingdom. Back to the book of Amos, back to my conversation with Dumbrell, about Amos. So Dumbrell says to me, he said, if you go and do a literary analysis, which I haven't, you will discover that the center of gravity in Amos is not in the second half of chapter five. The center of gravity of the book of Amos, the entire book is in the first half of Amos chapter five. And there, in Amos chapter 5, verse 1 to 17, which we have just heard it read this morning, you will find a very carefully crafted chiastic structure, something like this. Unbelievable. A shepherd could write something like that. On the outer layer, in section A and A prime, you have lament the death of a nation, and then moving to the center, call to seek God and live. And moving further in, failure of covenantal justice. And finally, in the heart of the matter, a hymn of praise to Yahweh. But here what we see is a very elaborate song of lament for Israel. It's a very sad song. It's a song of lament for the nation of Israel, which if you remember the historical background, they were undergoing a very prosperous time. Militarily, they are very strong, you know, and, and uh, economically, they are very prosperous. And because of all their pride, they were worshiping all the idols. And God, through the prophet Amos, is declaring a judgment for a not so distant future. This nation will fail. This nation will be will vanish from the face of this earth. It's a song of lament for, for Israel. So this morning I want to take you through this song. We'll first look at section A and A prime, lament the death of nation, and followed by section C and C prime, failure of covenantal justice. I want you to notice how I titled these two sections. 
not failure of social justice, but failure of covenantal justice. It's very important we got the title right, because if you get the title wrong, your application will be all wrong. What God is condemning them is not social justice, a lack of social justice, but lack of covenantal justice. We'll come back to that later. And after that, we'll move to the blue side. We'll go to section D when we look at the hymn of praise to Yahweh. And finally, we'll go back to section B and B prime, call to seek God and live. So let's begin with section A and A prime. Here this word that I take up over in Lamentation, O house of Israel, verse one. Fallen no more to rise is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land with none to raise her up. They shall call the farmer to mourning and to willing those who are skilled in lamentation and in all vineyards they shall be willing for I will pass through your midst, said the Lord. Remember they were undergoing a period of great prosperity and mighty and might in, in their politics and military strength. And yet God declared, fallen, fallen, fallen will this nation be because I will walk in your midst. I will send another a Gentile nation. The Assyrians will come and wipe you out. And it's not they who are wiping you out. It's me who is doing the judgment. So in fact, indeed, this kingdom of Israel will soon receive God's wrathful judgment. That Assyrians will come around 30 to 40 years later and will take these people into exile and they will wipe out the entire nation. Now what leads to this death of a nation is the multitude of sins that they, were, they are committing. So let me take you to section C and C prime to look at the sins that they are committing. Verse 7, O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, they hate him who reproves in the gate and abhor him who speaks the truth. You trample the poor, and you exact taxes of grain from him. You afflict the righteous, take a bribe, and turn aside the needy at the gates. Now before you think along the line of social justice, let me remind you again that the failure to love the neighbor is rooted in something else. It doesn't begin right straight to the failure to love their neighbor. The failure to love their neighbor is rooted in the failure to love the Lord their God and obey his words. In other words, before they forsake the covenant, their covenant with neighbor, they have first forsaken their covenant with God. One is the symptoms, the other one the roots of the problem. The symptom, what we are seeing here is that they fail to love the neighbors, but there's a root of the problem. The root of the problem is they have failed to obey and to love the Lord their God. How will God respond to their failing every rebellion? Let me take you to section D of the classic structure, the very middle, the hymn of praise to Yahweh. Verse 8 and verse 9. He made the Pleiades and Orion and turn star a uh, darkness into morning and darken the day into light and call for water of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth the lord is his name he makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that the destruction comes upon the fortress now here we see two parallel yet contrasting picture about Yahweh. The first picture is a picture of his powerful creation. He turned darkness into morning, into morning. And then there is a second picture, a second picture of powerful destruction. So what is powerful creation? The other one is powerful destruction. Let's look at the second picture first. The second picture is a picture of his destructive power. He darkens the day into night. He called the waters of the sea and poured them out on the surface 
of the earth. Now, what is that picture all about? Now, if you are familiar with your Old Testament, you know it is the judgment by way of Noah's flood. What will God do? Well, look at his power. He caused the water and poured them out to cover the face of the earth. And that is God's judgment by ways of Noah's flood. And such judgment will surely come to the sinful, rebellious people who refuse to love the Lord and do not love the neighbor and, and do not obey the covenant they have with God and with their neighbor. So that's the first picture. Now, on the other hand, you go back to the opening lines of the verse. The hymn also praised God for his great power of creation. He turns deep darkness into morning, into morning light. Now, what picture is that? It's actually a picture of Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How? The earth was without form and void. Darkness was all over the face of the deep. So the earth was dark. And then who turned darkness into light? Well, it is God. How did he do that? God said, let there be light. And there was light. So it's bringing us back to Genesis chapter 1, when God had this great creative power to turn darkness into light. But this is also a picture given by Apostle John in John chapter 1. Right, the, the passage that Angus almost read to you, <laughs> wanted to read to you. And it is the correct picture. It is also a light in darkness picture. The light of life shining into a world of darkness. The light shines in the darkness from John chapter 1 verse 5. The darkness has not overcome it. The true light which gives light to everyone is coming into this world. So it's a picture of creation, but it's also a picture of salvation in John, right? In John, the light coming to shine upon this dark world to save these people. A picture of creation, a picture of salvation. It is as if God is saying that even in the midst of this flood, right, an ark of salvation is being provided for all who are returning to him. And that takes us to section B and B prime. Call to seek the Lord and live. There is still a chance for salvation. So Amos chapter 5 verse 4. Seek me and live. Chapter 5 verse 6. Seek the Lord and live. How so? Well, read the fine print. Seek me and live. Verse 4. But do not seek Bethel and do not enter into Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgo shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. So biblical scholars tell us that during the time of Amos, these three places, Bethel, Gilgo, and Beersheba, they are famous for something. They are famous for idol worship. They are famous for mixed worship. So you can imagine some of the MTL stations that we have. You know, they are famous for idol worship, but they're also famous for a Christian church that preaches prosperity gospel. You understand? Mix and match. It is not just, oh, you know, we, we don't worship Yahweh here. No, we worship Yahweh here, but we worship Yahweh here plus something else. We mix and match whatever you like. You can pick a little bit of Yahweh, a little bit of this one. Whatever that works for you, we preach when we worship. And so, so, you know, Amos is saying that do not seek over these idol worshippers. Do not seek over these mixed worship places. Seek the Lord. What does that mean? Seek the Lord only. It's not just I seek the Lord. Do you, do, you, do you worship the Lord? Well, I do. But I also worship something else. Now that wouldn't work. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord only. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Therefore, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your might, right? It's you have to give everything of you to God. That is what seeking the Lord means. And then you shall live. Verse 14 and 15. And then seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant 
of Joseph. So in the beginning, you have seek the Lord, section B. Now in section B prime, seek good and hate evil. What is that God talking to us? You see, the law and the statue of God are good. The practices of the idol worshippers are evil. So the idea is not so much let's go and do good and you'll be fine. No, the idea is that go back to the root of the problem. Love the Lord first and establish a relationship with the Lord. Keep his commandment and therefore you also love your neighbor. Choose Yahweh, not the other idols. And when you do that, God will be gracious to you. Now notice how Amos phrased it. You will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. It's no longer the entire nation. We know the entire nation have fallen into sin and idolatry, but a small number of people, no longer the entire nation. The, the, the nation is bad, it's, it's gone. But there may yet be a small percentage, a small remnant who return, who repent, who seek the Lord with all their heart. God will be gracious to them. So this is what Amos is declaring to Israel. The wrath and the judgment of God are coming. The people will be taken into exile. The kingdom will be no more utterly destroyed. Yet within that nation, within that kingdom, there will be a small number of people. If anyone will return and seek the Lord only, forsaking all idols, seek the Lord Listen to his word, repent, live out a life of justice and mercy. God will be gracious to them. God will save no longer the entire nation, but God will save the remnant of Joseph. So once again, this is the big picture that we are looking at. A lament for Israel laments the death of a nation called to seek the Lord and live, failure of covenantal justice, and finally a hymn of praise to Yahweh. It's a song of lament for Israel for, for, for obvious reasons, because the wrath of God will be coming upon them. But it's also a hymn of praise to Yahweh. Why? Because Yahweh not only judge, he also create. He not only kill, he also Save and finally to the remnant. If you are the remnant and reading, singing this song, this song, this hymn, it will become for you a song of hope, a song of gracious salvation may come out of the song of lament. And what Amos said is that the Lord can and will turn deep darkness into morning light. Even though you are going to experience the, the deep darkness, God will and God can turn this deep darkness into morning light. Though Israelites shall be sent into exile, they will yet be restored and return. And though they shall be put to death, there will yet be a resurrection in the future. Now, we need to be reminded here that the remnant, the small group of remnants, salvation, their salvation, rests not upon their own good deeds. Sometimes we misunderstand this. We read the Bible, uh, divided them into golden verses, and we pick out some golden verses and say, okay, if we seek justice, we'll live. No, I think you got it wrong. We must be reminded that as a whole, when you read through the entire Bible, you know that the remnant salvation rests not on their own good deeds or their, their exercising justice and mercy. Of course, they must repent and return. Otherwise, there will be no salvation on that. But their salvation is not based on their own turning, their own good deed. The restoration and resurrection of the remnant rests upon God's promise. And throughout the entire Old Testament, God has promised us a savior king, a savior king who will die for the remnant, who will be raised for the remnant as well. He will die in the place of the remnant to pay for their sins, and he will be raised for the remnant to give them new life. And that is how we move from the Old to the New Testament. Who is God's chosen savior king? And he is none other than our Lord 
Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus, the people of God will experience a very profound reversal of fortune. Only because of Jesus. It's no longer lament on the devil of nation. Remember, section top and bottom, I changed them now, reverse it from A to D now. We begin with now the outer layers. It's no longer lament on the death of a nation, but rather the restoration of a remnant. Not the whole nation, but the restoration of a small remnant. And then according to the kingdom vision of prophet Amos, this restored remnant of God will possess two distinctive characteristics. So we're going to see moving inside now. These two distinctive characteristics will be on the remnant with which are the two. The first is that they will seek the Lord with all their heart. Remember, seek the Lord and live. And seek the Lord doesn't mean that I go to church. You can go to church all you want, but the question is, what are you going to do with other idols in your heart and around you on a daily basis? Seek the Lord, seek the Lord with all your heart. Seek the Lord and nothing else. So this is one characteristic of the remnant. The second one is that they will live out, sorry, they will live out their lives in covenantal righteousness. So again, it's not social, social justice, but they will live out their life in covenantal righteousness. What does it mean? That means they will live just and rebel. They will, do, they will exercise just and righteous deed within God's covenant community. So the idea is not so much that we pursue social justice. The idea is that we will do the right thing. We will establish right relationship within God's covenant community. In the Old Testament, the covenant community is the whole entire nation, right? But in the New Testament, it's no more nation because there was no more. But what we have is the covenantal community, the church. So if you find this vague and not clear what I'm thinking about, let me take you from the old to the new. How do all these look when we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Well, it all begins with darkness into morning light. Let me take you to Acts chapter 2, verse 23. And this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledgement of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of the lawless man. You see, the light of this world is now covered in complete darkness. Remember at the cross, you know, that, that the entire world suddenly darkens. There was this deep darkness covering when Jesus was nailed to the tree. And you crucify and kill by the hands of this lawless man. But yet God raised him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So God turned that deep darkness now into morning light. And through Jesus' death and resurrection, that's where salvation comes to us. Through this turning from darkness into light, Jesus is crucified for repentant sinner, and on the cross he paid for our sin, he reconciled us back to God. But that's only half of the gospel. There's still a second half. He's raised for repentant sinners. And through his resurrection, he brings life and light into our life, into those who follow him. So he paid for our sin, but he also brings light and life back into our life. And this is what the New Testament testifies. It's not just that I, I buy insurance, Jesus pay it all, and I'm happily, I got this passport, go to heaven. No. His resurrection shines light, powerful light of creation into my life. I now experience a new life, and that's what Paul writes about in Ephesians. So let me read to you with you Ephesians chapter 1. And you, Paul is writing to the Ephesians, you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the cause of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of the disobedience. So Paul said, you, before you became a Christian, you are all dead in trespasses and sin. You ever thought about yourself being dead? 
Assuming that if you are not yet a Christian or you, before you became a Christian, have you ever thought that you were actually dead? No, we don't, right? We're very much alive. We're very active and lively in sinning. But God said, when he looked down from heaven to us, we're all dead. There are two ways to live. There are two kingdoms to live in. One is God's kingdom of light, which is way high there. When you are in the kingdom of light, you are waiting for your final destiny, the eternal life. And then there's another kingdom that before we became Christian, we all live in Satan's kingdom of darkness. We live in that kingdom of darkness. We're awaiting eternal judgment. So God said, when before we became a Christian, we were dead, even though we're alive, right? Physically, the doctor would tell you, well, you're definitely alive. Why would you say you're dead? But the pastor would tell you, you are dead. Because what you can do is to, dis you, you can only disobey God. You can only distrust God. You cannot give yourself to him. You were living in the kingdom of darkness, awaiting for eternal judgment. Something must change in your life. Something must change in this world. And that something is the phrase, but God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, is not but I one day decided that I'm going to be a good man. That's what the other religion will say, right? What's the turning point of this world? What's the turning point in your life? But I, waking up one day, decided that I'm going to be a good man. No. The turning point in the history of mankind, the turning point in your life and mine, is but God. But God, being rich in mercy, and because of this great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, make us alive together with Christ. There is a point in my life, there's a point in your life, that God's mercy and love invaded us. And I don't mean because last week you were taking your DSC and you didn't study well and God saved you by bringing to remembrance something you have forgotten. So he is rich in mercy. And now we talk about this. That's not biblical language. The Bible don't talk about mercy and love that way. It talk about mercy and love because we were dead in our trespasses and he made us alive. There was one point before you became a Christian. Or maybe you are not even a Christian right now. You still haven't experienced that. You were just living on your own. You're living for this world. All you see is that you have no understanding of the heavenly thing. But then at one point, God invaded your life. He is being rich in mercy and love. He invaded your life where you were dead in your trespasses. He made you alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and sit us with him in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus, think about the change that is happening to you. What is the change? The change that you were dead, you were living like any other one, someone in Hong Kong, going for your work, trying to earn more money, and trying to plan for your future. And you think that you're alive, but you are actually dead. And then God invaded you. Suddenly you realize how futile that your life is. How, how you are just preparing yourself for an eternal doom. And so you became alive. You confess your sin, you turn to Christ, and God raised you up from the dead. You begin to see there is another kingdom that now you are in, and there is another kingdom to live for. And then God not only raised you up to life, He raised you up and seated you in the heavenly what does it all mean? Now people will say, well, how do you apply this? People will say, well, it's easy to apply. That means that I have a passport to heaven. He raised me up to heaven. There he registered an account for me in heaven. So when I walk into the door of heaven, when I die, that my account has already been created. So people welcome me into eternal heavenly. Now that's not what Paul is saying. Paul gave us a very glorious application when he tells us the spiritual truth that we are not just raised with him, but we are sitting with him in heaven. What does that mean? What is the application? The application is this, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above. Where Christ is and sit at the right hand of God, 
if your life is now in union with Christ, if you have been raised with Christ, you die with him, you raise with him, and you sit at heaven, what do you do? Seek the thing above. And Paul continued this glorious application. Set your minds on things that are above, not the things that are on earth. Oh, how glorious is that resurrection. It raised us all the way to heaven so that, with a purpose clause, right? So that we may seek the things above. And we may set our mind on things that are above and not the things that are on earth. And Paul said, for you die and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So dear friend, let me ask you, have you experienced that invasion of God? Have you experienced that invasion of God's grace and mercy upon your life? Have you been awakened to the fact that you are a sinner awaiting for doom and you have no hope apart from Jesus, his death and resurrection? Now, if you haven't experienced that great love and mercy, you need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all very desperate for God's grace and mercy, you know. And by that, I don't mean that you have a big exam next week or you have a medical crisis in your life and that let me pray for you so that God's mercy and grace will be upon you. That was not your problem, not your greatest problem. Your greatest problem is your sin and the eternal destiny that is awaiting you. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, and after death, there is judgment. And brother and sister, let me ask you this. You may have been attending church for ever, for many, many years, but have you died with Christ and be raised with Him? Have you been sitting with Him in the heaven? Have you been thinking about things about? Have you been seeking the things about? If you haven't, you need to repent and return to God also. Because our mind, our life has to be set on this path to things about. Listen to Peter's exhortation to us on Pentecost. Sunday, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is Peter speaking, not me. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Peter said, today is the day, today is the day to turn and to repent. The promise is for you, the promise of salvation, the promise of Jesus, the promise of Jesus crucified and risen and now ascended into heaven. That promise, all embedded in Jesus, is for you and your children. Now that's not you, it's the Jews. For you and the children, referring to the Jews. But what about us? Well, And also for all who are far off, that's us. Because we are the Gentiles. We are so far off from the scripture once upon a time. Now we have been drawn near. We have the Bible. We have the word of God. We have God speaking to us through all these prophets and apostles. That promise is now for us who are far off the Gentiles. So grab the promise while well, you can today. And after that, after their preaching, after their turning to grab hold of the promise, they did not go home. They continue to devote themselves. They come together seeking the Lord. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And with many other words, Peter bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. So I will say the same thing to you too. Save yourself from this crooked generation. Do not think that, oh, you know, today I became a Christian. Today I confessed my sin. Today I got the insurance deal. It's free. And I got my passport. No. Save yourself from this crooked generation. And these people do not just go home. They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. Listen, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. 
It's a great contrast. It's the exact opposite of Israel. What did Israel do? They rejected the law of God. So you have the Israel, the Old Testament Israel. They rejected the law of God. In the New Testament church, what did they do? They devoted it into the apostle teaching. One group of people. Just don't trouble me with these words. It's too long, too boring. Give me the lies of the idol. And here in the New Testament, you have a group of people who want nothing of that. They Not only did they not reject the law of God, they devoted themselves to the apostle, to the prophets, teaching, and more than that. They devoted themselves to living out the kingdom, live out covenantal righteousness. Now, so how does it look like to live out covenantal righteousness? It's not the same as social justice. It's covenantal righteousness. So Acts chapter 2, verse 44, and later on in Acts 4 as well, we have a picture of how do you live out covenantal righteousness. And all who believe were together and have all things in common. And they were selling their possession and belonging and distributing the proceed to all as any had need. This is not communism. Now, this is not that everybody have to put all the possession up. Uh, the church will decide who got what. No, this is not. The idea is that they live in covenantal community. And when they see need, when they see somebody is poor, and that somebody is not, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about non-Christian, I'm talking about Christian here. Because they are in covenant with each other. They will share their resources so that what? So that... There is no one who have need. And you see the same picture in Acts chapter 4, verse 34. There was not a needy person among them. Why? Because people share. Because people give. They don't see their own possession as their own. They see their brother's need. They see the neighbor's need. Again, here we're not talking about our community in Causeway Bay or Wan Chai or Gun Tong. This is not what it is talking about. It's talking about the covenant community. For as many who were owner of the land and houses sold them and brought the proceed of what was sold and lay it before the apostle's feet and it was distributed to each at, at any had need. It's about need. It's driven by need. It's driven by the covenant with God and with their own fellow believers. But we're still not at the end. Why? Because we're reading the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the goal, the final objective of the book of Acts is not to have a utopia where everybody shares and there is no need for each one. What is the final objective? What is the point of selling possession? What's the point of sharing resources? What's the point of doing all this sacrificially? The point is that so that we may be witnesses to the end of this earth. So this is something new when you move from the old to the new. Because in the Old Testament, there was no this go and make disciples of all nations. In the Old Testament, it's come to Jerusalem and see how we live. But now we're moving to the New Testament. We hear Jesus saying the Great Commission, go and make disciples. That was revolutionary. Now we have to go. So what are these resources for? These resources are not for us to create a utopia, a community with no need. These resources are eventually used for the evangelization of this world, from preaching the gospel to the end of this earth. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This is the final goal. This is the glorious vision. And let me bring you back one more time to the final picture, to that grand vision that God is creating, moving from the old to the new. And here we have the vision of Amos in the old. You say, Amos is a one-eyed prophet. Amos is like a blurry-eyed prophet. He sees something. He can envision what the covenant community ought to be. So he began with the restoration of a remnant. 
And then this remnant will seek the Lord with their heart. And this remnant will live out covenantal righteousness. That's all he can see. But we can see something far better. What we have seen here is a realization of that dream, turning that black and white picture into full color HD picture. We're raised with Christ, and in him we are restored. We are the remnant. We are now seated with Christ in heaven. We think about things about. We set our mind on things about. We repent and be devoted to the teaching of the apostles to the gospel, to the breaking of bread, to the prayer, to the fellowship. And then we have all things, all our possessions, all our skills and our talent, everything to be shared. And not to create an earthly utopia, but all that we have, all that I am, we devoted it to become witnesses to the end of the earth. What a glorious vision that is. And what a time to talk about that on Mother's Day. Because this is our mother. And our mother needs to recover this vision so that our mother will be strong and our mother church can nurse many children to health and to great strength. May the Lord use our church, make us into something like this, raised with Christ, and be with him in the heavenly. Seek the things about, repent and be devoted to the things about, share all our earthly resources to live in covenantal community. And this community is driven by a great desire, zeal, to share the gospel to the end of this world. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we feel exhausting even just thinking through all these verses, how you turn a lament for Israel into a praise for the one true God, into a song of hope and grace for the remnant. Oh, how Amos would love to see that picture being realized in the New Testament church. He was looking from far away. He was a one-eyed prophet. He was a blurry-eyed prophet. Prophet. He couldn't see far enough, and for him to even be dreaming about a day where there will be a people who actually seek the Lord with all their heart, who live in covenantal righteousness, that is already unthinkable. But in Jesus Christ and in the early church, we see something far greater. That it is not just that we can live in harmony and well sharing but we are so much more than that we are being we die with him we're raised with him we are sitting at the heavenly so that our whole citizenship our orientation of life change from the kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of life from the kingdom of this world into a kingdom of another world that unlike the people that in sins and trespasses we are free to live for things above. And you give us prophet, you give us apostle, you give us your word so we can devote it to living out this life. So we repent and we believe in the Lord Jesus. We are devoted to the apostle teaching and all that we have, all that we are, shall be used for your kingdom and for taking the gospel from this place to the end of this world. I know it's almost feel not real for me to say that when we are such a small group, such a weak community. But the vision come from the Lord and must be proclaimed as such. May you use us, feeble and weak and lowly as we are, to shape us into a community that will take your gospel from here onward to the end of this world. Thank you so much for being our good God. May you bless our church, bless our spiritual mother on earth, make her strong so that she may nurse her children with the true, pure gospel. Thank you so much for being our good God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.